Let me take you on an interesting tour of the horizon, end up in the United States, but let's go with that in a very basic way. I want to distinguish in Europe, and I'm going to use France as the example, but I want to distinguish between anti-Semitism in and anti-Semitism of. One of the things you have to ask the question is, is there anti-Semitism in France? The answer is absolutely yes. Is there anti-Semitism of France? And for that, we have to grapple with a different element. What do I mean by that? The basic elements of anti-Semitism in France, and you can describe it in the range of Europe throughout, basic elements of anti-Semitism in France is the, the uh, presence of a large Muslim immigration community that is living in but is not culturally of France. And by that I mean that there is a correlation and a direct correlation, especially in the first <coughs> decade of the 2000 year, between essentially crises in the Middle East and attacks on Jews in France. Many of those were Muslim attacks on Jews, and ironically they were attacks on Jews who lived in an integrated Muslim community, Muslim Jewish community, and they were in response not to events in France, but to events in Israel, Intifada II, Gaza, war, the war in Lebanon, etc., etc. France had two additional problems, uh, three additional problems that we have to talk about. The first it had, it is, is it had no definition of something called a hate crime. <coughs> And a hate crime is an interesting thing because a hate crime means that if a rabbi is attacked on his way to synagogue, it is an attack. If it's a hate crime, then it involves the very fabric of society. If a swastika is dubbed on the wall and it's a graffiti offense, it is not investigated in the same way that a swastika dubbed on the wall if it's a hate crime would be treated. So, for example, if a swastika were put on a synagogue building in the United States, you would expect what? The mayor to come out and say, this does not represent us. You'd expect the chief of police to say, we will do everything imaginable to catch the perpetrators. This attorney said, we will throw the book at them. And you would expect a ceremony in which a priest and a minister, a rabbi, and maybe even an imam would be scrubbing off the graffiti because it's regarded as an attack on the very fabric of society. France, secondly, had a second problem, which is that, a, and a serious problem, which is if you were culturally, if you were acculturated to France, you accepted Jews, Muslims, Catholics, and atheists as a natural part of your cultural environment, your business environment, your cultural environment, your university environment, etc., etc. And you had the idea that this was a broader society taking place. If you were not acculturated, you did not see that as part of the integrated France, and you saw France as an alien environment and its values as an imposition on you. And France and other European countries don't have a real strategy of what we have in the United States, which is the integration of minority groups and making them part of the larger society. And consequently, they remained alien. Add to that the following that in France you have the problem of the left, which is anti-Israel, and you then have the very interesting problem of the right, but even there on the right, the right tends generally to be pro-Israel in most of Europe, but not necessarily pro-Jewish, because they see Jews as antithetical to the range of values that they want. If you go through Eastern Europe, you have the same phenomenon. You have nationalist governments in, for example, Poland and Hungary that are trying, and Lithuania that are trying to rewrite the history of the Holocaust to paint themselves as righteous and, and as saviors of the Jews, 
who are pro-Israel, uh, in part because Israel is tough and nationalistic and is not taking anything from anybody, but who are particularly anti-Jewish, meaning anti the Jews around them because they regard the Jews as a cosmopolitan force. And what you have, for example, is tensions between the Hungarian government and the Jewish community in the rewriting of the museums in Hungary. You have tensions in Poland. And ironically, in Poland, we're having a reception today for, at our home for Jonathan Orenstein, who's rebuilding the Polish Jewish community. In Poland, the synagogues are safe. But the government's trying to rewrite and to punish anybody who tells a history of Poland that is less than the nobility of the Polish people. And to the best of my recollection, that's not an accurate accounting <laughs> of the history. And I think I may know a little bit about the history. One other element, which is that there are radicalization that takes place, which is a symptom of alienation. And the radicalization takes place within the mosque. And part of what we have throughout the world today is that religious fundamentalism and religious fanaticism is filling a vacuum in the identity of a whole range of elements of the population that is not being met by either the secular ethos or the generally liberal ethos. It's part of the search and people want a response. We see it throughout. This is a period, ironically, which happens historically again and again. It's a period of religious revival and it's a period of fundamentalist revival in a very basic way, hitting the Islamic world more intensely because the Islamic world has not undergone the period of time of liberalization that was reflected in the Christian and Jewish religious ethos, and that happens. Now, we have an additional problem, which is that the government, an additional peculiar issue, the governments now are deeply anti-anti-Semitism because they regard it as a threat to their society in Western Europe with the exception, by the way, of the left in England. So when the French prime minister says after hyper-kasher, France without its Jews is not France, and these are our people, that is an astounding statement coming 70 years after they wanted to expel Jews from France when the German uh, Prime Minister, when the German Chancellor walks in a demonstration against anti-Semitism, you have the top down protesting against it, not even because they love the Jews, mm -hmm. but because they despise the type of world that is represented in the anti-Semitism, in the anti-Semitism that is expressed on that. Candidly, the Prime Minister of Israel made a catastrophic mistake in France immediately after the element, which is that France was claiming the Jews as Frenchmen, and the Prime Minister was saying, come home. The bodies of the French Jews who were killed were buried in Israel instead of being in France and making France claim them. They then had a debate as to who was going to pay for the shipment of the bodies and the burial, which became very ugly. And the idea that the moment in which the France, France's president, France's prime minister, claiming the Jews as Frenchmen is not the moment at which you what? You go in the classical Zionist element, which is Jews go to your own home. And the irony of that, of course, and people pick it up, the irony of that is you can't then say, but remember, we're facing catastrophic nuclear annihilation from Iran, but we'll protect you. So you have a double speak coming out of Zionism, and we have to, uh, uh, out of the government of Israel dealing with this, and we have to be careful because one of the things that you find throughout and we're articulating today, which is going to make some of us uncomfortable, is the government of Israel is representing the interests of the Israeli government 
and not necessarily the interest of Jews, and we'll come to that when we come to the United States. But we can see it, for example, in the way in which it's cozying up to governments that are trying to rewrite the history of the Holocaust. We can see it in the way in which we have a disconnect in terms of the way in which the, the government of Israel expressed itself on Charlottesville and the whole range of things. And it's behaving as a representative of the interests, the, the perceived interests of the state of Israel and very differently than necessarily the interests of the Jewish community. And the Jewish community in a variety of places is beginning to sense that. What are elements of the good news in that? And there is some, but not much. Let's take a look at a little bit of the anti-Semitism on the right. And let's take as an example the transition in um, France between Le Pen daughter and Le Pen father. Le Pen father is an outright anti-Semite. Le Pen daughter felt that she had to modify that in order to go a little bit mainstream. Uh, consider, for example, the same phenomenon, and I'm not equating the measure of anti-Semitism at all with Ron Paul and Rand Paul. And you see that Rand Paul could not maintain the views of Ron Paul and hope to go mainstream in a very basic way. But the Jew as a cosmopolitan force, and this is where you get into the issue of George Soros and the open university and all of that, the Jew as a cosmopolitan force becomes the enemy of a range of governments and the, re the enemy of a range of right-wing governments, and the left-wing the left-wing parties have a problem, and it's called the Israel problem, and we'll talk about the Israel problem in a bit, but the Israel problem becomes a major problem with regard to the left wing, because when you have criticism of the policies of the state of Israel, it is regarded by segments of the population as license to attack these Jews. And that is, they don't differentiate between Jew and Jew. You attack Israel, therefore you can take it out on the Jew next door. But you have a top-down phenomenon that is anti-anti-Semitism. You have a business elite that is anti-anti-Semitism. You have a population that is non-integrated, that has the potential of being moved to large measures of anti-Semitism. You have a right-wing nationalist population that is anti the Jews, especially the Jews within them, especially some of the values of the Jews, anti coming to terms with the history with regard to the Jews, most especially in Eastern Europe. Lithuania, for example, they just banned a, uh, uh, all the publications of a best-selling author um, who had written about Lithuanian complicity in the Holocaust. And they even uh, said, essentially, that she happens to be living with a Jewish man who was regarded as a public enemy because he went after Lithuanian um, um, uh, perpetrators, Lithuanian uh, Nazi war criminals. <coughs> and they uh, banned her books despite the fact that the publisher was making money off the books. And publishers had to feel an awful lot of pressure to ban best-selling books in a country such as Lithuania. Okay, let's now go to the United States. And let's talk about the United States. <coughs> and let's talk about the United States candidly and openly. I am going to say something which I want you to, if you quote me, <laughs> I want you to quote me only in the entire sentence. If you quote half the sentence, I will deny it. If you say the entire <laughs> sentence, I will affirm it. The sentence is, there is no evidence that anti-Semitism is on the rise in the United States, except that, meaning that there's no larger segment of the population that is anti-Semitic, 
no evidence whatsoever of that, except for the fact that you now have permission to express hatred that you feel, and that permission is without restraint, and given the nature of the internet and social communication, you now have not only the possibility of its expression, but a megaphone to its expression. What do I mean by that? Do you understand the complexity of the sentence? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Meaning the percentage of the population that is anti-Semitic has decreased dramatically. Restraint on the expression of um, anti-Semitism and all other forms of hatred has increased dramatically. Uh, the absence of restraint has increased dramatically. And that means that if you ask any Jew in America, is anti-Semitism on the rise? The answer is yes. And the argument behind that is because we are feeling things we didn't feel and we didn't hear for an entire generation. And now we have the capacity to, they have the capacity to create communities that do this in a very basic way, and that leaves us in a peculiar situation. What was the experience of the generation that I grew up in? The experience of the generation that I grew up in was the breaking of all sorts of barriers, the shattering of the glass ceiling. There, my generation experienced no obstacles to advancement because we were Jewish. And not only that, we also experienced the freedom that the people 10 years older than I am did not experience with regard to expressing our Jewishness. It's the equivalent, uh, I'll give you two examples, it's the equivalent of the Yarmulke at Harvard. In 1923, a great, one of the greatest Jewish scholars of the early generation, Harry Austin Wolfson, said, some are born blind, some are born lame, and some are born Jewish. <laughs> and he wrote that in the menorah, and it's not a laughing matter. He meant Jewishness was a handicap, which is why people changed names, why people did a whole range of things. In the 50s, there was a feeling you could not be too Jewish, T-O-O -O Jewish, and you had to mute it and think of Philip Roth's Eli the Fanatic, right, who makes all these Jews in the suburbia feel uncomfortable. But think also of great men. Yitz Greenberg, Aaron Lichtenstein, who at Harvard, because they were Orthodox Jews, would never walk without a hat. But when they came into a classroom, they took off their hat. And they would go back in the 70s after the collapse, as it were, of the WASP establishment and that heterogeneity after Kennedy had admitted immigrants into the United States after Black is Beautiful. They would walk into Harvard and see young men wearing uh, with uh, in jeans with their beautiful um, uh, dates who had uh, mini skirts walking hand in hand and what they envied them was not the sexuality of the dates but the ability to wear a yarmulke in public. Mm -hmm. And some of you know it because Jews even, to, even wear Jewish stars which was a symbol of what? A symbol of marking people for murder they now wear Jewish stars as what? Jewelry on, uh, as jewelry ornaments with pride, wear it with pride, meaning that all of a sudden you could express Jewishness in public. And therefore we had this tremendous freedom. You want a story of it? It's a man by the name of Irving Shapiro who was the first, uh, um, um, first Jewish chairman of the board of uh, DuPont. Began as a um, Assistant General Counsel, when he began his job, the General Counsel came to him and said, uh, you know, you want to advance in this company, you're best off changing your name. Comes back in a day later, he said, I brought you tickets to Detroit. And he said, why the hell would I want to go to Detroit? He said, I want you to tell my father that the name he brought me into the world with is not the name that I can carry on. He then was offered membership in the country club. We don't accept, we don't normally accept your people, but we'll make an exception to you. Groucho Marx, I never would want to join a club that would have me as a member, <laughs> which is a statement, what, of that type of, and you even have an echo of that in Larry David, 
when you have the, the thing about the golf club and joining the non-Jewish country club after he's thrown out of the Jewish one. And Irving Shapiro then says, I don't play golf. When he becomes chairman of the board of DuPont, he deliberately, because DuPont had been historically an anti-Semitic company, deliberately takes the chairmanship of United Jewish Appeal. <laughs> and that was a sense of the defiance of Jews of that generation, the breaking of barriers. Second story, they just honored Henry Rusovsky at Harvard. Henry Rusovsky was the man when Harvard Hillel moved from the periphery of the campus to the center of campus. Rusovsky was the, was the uh, provost of Harvard, and he led the procession of the Torah through the Harvard campus. And he said the following, he said, the movement of Hillel from the periphery of campus to its center is the movement of Jews from the periphery of Harvard to its center, and here we shall remain. He was offered the presidency of Yale, and his Israeli wife said to him, you must accept it, you'd be the first president of Yale. His response to her was, um, I don't have to accept it, it is inevitable that Yale have a Jewish president, let me be the first Jew to turn down the president. <laughs> <laughs> and the reality is that Yale has subsequently had two Jewish presidents. And even in America 2000, what did we have? The candidate for the vice president of the United States was not only a Jew, but an Orthodox Jew who introduced 24-6. And there was no evidence whatsoever that what? that there was any opposition to the fact that he was Jewish as an obstacle to election. In fact, they won a plurality, they won a, uh, a, the popular vote, even if they lost the electoral college, and you had not only a Jew, but an identified Orthodox Jew mm -hmm. who was being respected for it. What is the problem in America today? The problem in America today is that essentially if you hate, you have a megaphone to express your hatred, and you feel no restraint in expressing that hatred. And you have to understand that because if you don't understand the power of the social communities in the social media that are involved in that. Now also look at measuring tools. I don't have it here, but if you look, ADL has done a phenomenal job of using the same questions for the last 50 years in measuring anti-Semitism. But there's a problem with their methods, meaning you have a longitudinal study of 50 years, but they don't recognize in their tools that there's been a change of reality. So for example, if I ask you the question, do Jews have a disproportionate influence on the economy? And you say, yes. Are you saying something that's false? No. No. The chairman of the Federal Reserve right now is Jewish. The vice chairman up until two months ago was an Israeli man of dual citizenship who had been chairman of the, of the, federal, the equivalent of the Federal Reserve in Israel. The predecessor of the, Fe of the Federal Reserve was a man by the name of, Shalom, uh, of the Federal Reserve was Shalom Ben Bernanke. His <laughs> predecessor was Alan Greenspan. Yeah. Of the President Obama, anti-Semitic President Obama, was an Orthodox Jew, and the head of the Council of Economic, uh, uh, the Treasury Secretary today is a Jew. The head of the Council of Economic Advisors for the White House is what? Is Jewish his predecessor uh, was Jewish, and cons and Jews now are no longer out of the banking industry into Jewish banks, but the chairman of the board of many of the major banks are Jewish, and there's no obstacle to Jews and corporations. But if you ask the question, do Jews control the economy? Then the question becomes, what does control mean? Uh, and the question also in Hollywood is, do Jews control the media? And the question is different if you ask, are Jews disproportionately represented in the media? Jews disproportionately represent in the media, the answer, reality is what? Yes. yes. 
Uh, and we even make jokes of it. I was at an award ceremony uh, for Roman Catholics in the movie industry, and Steven Spielberg was invited to give a uh, presentation to a friend of his, and he got up, he looked out at the audience, and he said, oh my God, I never realized there were this many Goyim in the industry. <laughs> <laughs> and everybody what? Everybody laughed because essentially he was dealing with the mythos of what's involved. So, now let me also say something else, which um, the fact that there is the expression of hatred now that is widespread offers us coalition opportunities that were different than the coalition opportunities we had five years ago. Uh, I'm going to say something that is peculiar, which is that uh, we have to thank the current situation for the lack of influence of BDS. Now, you, you're all going to disagree with that, but you have to understand that campuses, which are the loudmouth for BDS, have an agenda that is limited. And the agenda now on campus is against all sorts of things of this administration. And there's only a limited bandwidth. And BDS is a holdover from previous time. And it's interesting to see that that's going to be there because the, uh, and the coalition possibilities. Let, let's give an example. Richard Spencer, uh, I was at the University of Michigan last week. Richard Spencer is speaking at the university, asked to speak at the University of Michigan. White uh, nationalist. Jews opposed, uh, and he's not, hasn't been invited by anybody. Jews opposed his coming, but so did African Americans. So did the immigrants and the foreign students association, so did Muslims. And in Michigan, there's a very large Muslim population, especially around Dearborn, Michigan. And all of a sudden, you have a whole bunch of groups working together <laughs> against this, because why, and liberal Protestants are part of that. And then you also have a very interesting thing with Richard Spencer, which is that the Republicans on campus are torn, but the Republicans don't want to be tarred with white supremacy as an ideology. And consequently, the nature of the coalition building is large. Interestingly enough, Tuesday they had a vote on BDS barely heard on campus, and an interesting phenomenon. Let's now talk about uh, two cases. Number one, Israel is, in all discussions of anti-Semitism, the elephant in the room. How do you know the difference between opposition to the policies of the state of Israel and anti-Semitism? Nathan Sharansky has given us a three Ds, has given us a way of understanding that. Three things differentiate when do you have anti-Semitism as opposed to opposition to the state of Israel. And we have all sorts of opposition to the state of Israel, or to the policies of the state of Israel. One is demonization, double standards, and delegitimization. Let me repeat that, the three Ds. Double standards, delegitimization, demonization. Double standards ends up being when you judge Israel by one set of standards and the rest of the world by another. If, for example, the bombing of Dresden was a legitimate act during World War II, then the question becomes what standard are you going to use to criticize some bombing with regard to Gaza. If the wholesale bombing of a civilian population, you're judging it by one standard. If Israel's judged by a standard that is different than anybody else, that runs the gamut as to what anti-Semitism, uh, where it's the differentiation. Delegitimation comes from the fact that the state has problems and its policies are not good to it has no right to exist. 
And once you say it has no right to exist, if Israel is a colonial power and ha therefore has no right to exist and uh, took over a native population and what put them into, into a, um, uh, a difficult circumstances, a reservation or whatever have you, what does that say about the United States? And if it's legitimate for the United States, for us whites to have dis displaced the native population, then, and nobody says the United States doesn't have the right to exist, then what are you doing with delegitimization? And finally, demonization. Mm -hmm. And that is when Israel is the source of all evil. And that is changing, interestingly enough, on the landscape. Because right now you have a problem between Sunni and Shia in the Muslim world that is far, deep, far more deeply divisive and Israel is now establishing an operative coalition with the Sunni against the Shia. And uh, meaning that you have a relationship with Saudi Arabia, you have a relationship, uh, a clandestine relationship with Saudi Arabia and unspoken, you have a relationship with, um, with Egypt, you have a relationship with Jordan, and you have a whole range of things, and consequently, Israel is going to be less portrayed as the source of demonism. And the other good point on that is, uh, let, me, let me say, uh, to give you just two other pieces of good news, and then I'll wrap up. Those of us uh, who are my age lived through the 73 war. And we thought that in the 73 war, after the Arab in, uh, oil crisis, we thought that power in the last third of the 20th century and the like was going to be in the control of natural resources. The reality is power in the world, we've gone to a knowledge-based economy. And power and fortunes have been made not necessarily in the control of natural resources, but in the ability to get your hands around the knowledge that we have. Let's take a simple example. What does Google give you? In one sense, it gives you nothing, but it gives you your ability to access all the information that is out there. What did Michael Bloomberg make his fortune on by taking all the economic data that you have and giving you access to it, what? at your desk. The ability to work in a knowledge-based economy, this is where Israel has become, Israel has the per capita income of Switzerland. And Israel is thriving in a knowledge-based economy. When I'm asked about BDS on campus, I say I accept BDS. I think it's a terrific idea. Now you tell me one thing. Give me your phone. <laughs> Do not use Microsoft products, do not use Apple products, do not use the phone products, and tell me what you're going to do to access the databases of the library. And tell me if you're going to give your kids certain vaccines, and tell me if you're going to give your kids certain x-rays. But if you, I accept BDS, but let's go. <laughs> give that up and let's see how you're going to do on your dissertation, how you're going to do on your exam. Meaning that in a knowledge-based economy, we have an integration of knowledge, and Israel, in that knowledge-based economy, is doing very well. And for the first time, we used to have a joke in, in my generation. The joke was that Moses took the wrong turn. <laughs> Had he moved a little bit more south, he would have controlled, the Jews would have controlled all the oil. But now, with the combination of gas and oil findings and desalinization, Israel is going to be an ex exporter of water. And it's going to be adequately uh, prepared to handle the crisis with regard to energy. And the reality is that oil is going to be a less valuable commodity in the future. And the nonsense about um, uh, going back to a coal economy doesn't make any sense. We're going to all be going to a different type of energy system because they're going to become economically viable, which means that Israel has a certain viability with regard to that. And the other thing is, if Israel links up with Jordan and with Saudi Arabia with regard to water, 
all of you who saw um, um, what was that that film about the uh, the um, uh, the crisis the big short mm -hmm. what was the guy investing in at the end of the big short water, water. and we know in California the necessity of water and Israel itself mm -hmm. recycles 87 percent of its water and we recycle 17 percent of our water mm -hmm. which means that we have uh, we need to learn from Israel uh, with regard to that and the contacts in the Arab world with regard to water are astounding I know it because my brother-in-law is the former senior scientist uh, chief of science at Israel's EPA and we know what type of contacts he has and he travels all around the Middle East on his uh, on his Israeli passport with regard to that point being anti-semitism is a serious issue it's a radically different issue than it was a generation ago totally different than it was two generations ago and the last point I want to make is that if we think we are going to combat it with the tools that we had last generation or the generation before, <coughs> we're going to essentially be um, fighting the war with outmoded weapons and with weapons that don't work. Let's take questions, comments, response. You can throw your your exit me at this point. Yes, sir. Can you do me one favor, which is uh, because we don't necessarily know each other, just say one word about yourself, your name, and, and the like, so we know who we are. 